On September 17, 1998, CIA organized a conference at the National Defense University with the title, The U-2, A Revolution in Intelligence, in order to announce publicly the declassification of the secret U-2 operation under CIA from 1954 to 1974. In the introductory remarks, Mr. George Tennant, the director of CIA, said, The U-2 was indeed one of the CIA's greatest intelligence achievements. In fact, it may be one of the greatest achievements of any intelligence service of any nation. The conference arranged a memorial service to pay tribute to the U-2 pilots died in action including 10 pilots of Republic of China. But for some reason, the conference did not mention the operation over China. So I did an extensive research through the documents of in Taiwan, in the United States, in the Communist China, in addition to consulting colleagues, to piece together the whole picture of this joint operation between the United States and the Republic of China in Taiwan. By the consensus of our government, first group of six ROC Air Force pilots were selected to come to the United States to receive the U-2 flight training. Major Joe Jackson, Deputy Commander of the 4028th Strategic Weather Reconnaissance Squadron, came to Taiwan to take them to the Laughlin Air Force Base in March 1959. I was fortunate to be one of them. After ground school and a ride in U-3 to simulate the U-2 shadow approach, we started to fly solo in U-2As. Five of Chinese pilots completed training in September. We were supposed to carry out the mission over Communist China from Taiwan not long after we returned to Taiwan. By that time, a U-2 forced landing in Japan stirred up a lot of publicity. Then the Russian SA-2 shut down Gary Powers on May 1, 1960, which made the U-2s a world-renowned spy plane. This incident inevitably caused some delay. Not until January 1961, a ROC and U.S. Joint Squadron was established in Taiwan. CIA provided aircraft maintenance and logistics. ROC Air Force provided pilots and base support. The squadron was named as the 35th Squadron of ROC Air Force in, to the Chinese and as Detachment H of CIA to the Americans, with the Black Cat as the insignia. The penetration mission started at the beginning of 1962. The Chaikan's early warning radar could detect the U-2 almost as soon as taking off from the Taoyuan Air Base. Our communication intelligence in Taiwan could intercept the air defense communication, so both sides could pinpoint where the U-2 was flying anytime. Their jet fighters always came up to intercept, or they could not reach the altitude where the U-2 was flying. They just followed the U-2 and hoped some malfunction happened to the U-2 would force the U-2 to descend. The U-2 pilot could always see the Chai Kang's jet flying beneath with a long white contrail behind. The high resolution camera on U-2 could take photos above 70,000 feet which could distinguish automobile models in a parking lot. Its 12,000 feet long film could bring back an aerial photo map of roughly 200 miles wide by 2,000 miles long, 
which revealed not only the precise location of a target, but also the activities on the ground. Its wide band ELAN system could record a large amount of electromagnetic emissions in and above VHF frequencies, including radar signals excited by the U-2. The intelligence collected by these U-2 flights is tremendous. At that time, the Communist China already had the SA-2 surface-to-air missile in operation. In late 1958, the Soviet delivered five battalions of SA-2 to Chinese Communists. The same missile shot Gary Powers down in May 1960. They deployed these battalions around Peking area and did shoot down a B-57D in October 1959. In the first six months of 1962, the U-2s had flown over almost all the mainland China except Tibet and Xinjiang. The PRC decided to move all the SA-2 from Peking to the area where they expect the U-2 to fly over. The SA-2 effective range was about 20 miles. Four battalions were far from enough to cover all the strategic area over the mainland. However, they could guess where the next U-2 fly would be, and they were willing to move SA-2 battalions around in spite of the missile launchers and the guidance radar was very heavy and bulky. The equipment of Chai Kang's SA-2 battalion requires 56 railroad special cars to transport. They also had to travel in dark night to cover up their intention, and the many places could not be reached by railway. Nevertheless, the guessing game was finally rewarded by shooting down a U-2 on September 9, 1962. After Major Rudolph Anderson of the 4028th Squadron was shot down over Cuba during the US USSR missile crisis on October 27, 1962, CIA decided to install a radar warning receiver System 12 on U-2 to alert the pilot that enemy missile guidance radar had detected and locked on his aircraft. The pilot should deviate to fly around the missile site. With the protection of System 12, the missions were successful for more than a year. The development of nuclear weapons and the long-range missiles in Communist China were well monitored by the U-2. However, they soon realized each time they switched the radar on, the U-2 would turn away from their sight. So they tried to shorten the time between the radar switch on and the missile launching. They even deployed four battalions closely to form a front, which left no room for the U-2 to evade. This arrangement caused the second U-2 down on November 1, 1963. The pilot, Robin Ye, was severely wounded, then captured and harassed in the mainland for 19 years. From this wreckage of this U-2, Chai Khan found electronics of System 12. They found a way to defeat System 12 seven months later which caused the third U-2 being shut down over the mainland China on July 7, 1964. It was obvious that the electronic countermeasure equipment on board must be improved. A radar jammer system 13 was then installed on the U-2, which could make the target displayed on enemy radar monitor a short distance of the correct position. In the early stage of using System 13 was not flawless. The force U-2 
with System 13 protection was shut down on January 9, 1965. The pilot, Jack Zhang, was then captured and harassed in the mainland for 17 years. An improved model of System 13 seems working all right. As long as the pilot taking evasive maneuver properly, all the missiles launched were not able to touch you two for almost three years. In the meantime, the Chaikons developed their own model of surface-to-air missile named Red Flag based on the Russian SA-2 and successfully tested in June 1965. This picture was taken by a U-2 on a mission over southwest China while a missile was shooting at him. The Chai Kongs also tried to use MiG-21 and L-2L missiles to shoot down the intruders without success. From October 1964 to December 1966, the PRC had conducted five atomic bomb tests and it was predicted that an edge bomb would be tested in the summer of 1967. The test site would be Lotno in the Xinjiang Desert region. It was impossible for U-2 to reach there from Taiwan, even using Takli, a base in northern Thailand. The U-2 had to carry external fuel tanks and maintain the cruise altitude below 60,000 feet in first part of the mission. The altitude could be easily reached by a zooming of MiG-21. In the late night of May 7, 1967, a U-2 took off from Takli and flew across Burma, India, Himalaya Mountains to a lot known. Upon reaching the target, in the early morning, a 15-foot-long capsule was dropped from the U-2 near the test site. The capsule was designed to transmit the nuclear test data to a station in Taiwan. The H-bomb exploded in June. Unfortunately, the signal received in Taiwan was not totally satisfactory. Therefore, a following mission was dispatched to the test site in August to tune up the transmission of the seismic sensor by using a trailing antenna. On September 8, 1967, the Red Flag missile, along with ECCM equipment, which was developed based on electronic found in the fourth u 2 wreckage to shoot down the fifth U-2. At that time, the Tricons had deployed the red flag missiles all over the mainland. It was the time to consider whether this penetration mission should continue. Finally, after the last penetration on March 16, 1968, by Andy Fan, the U-2 missions were only dispatched along the coast over the high sea. The U-2R arrived at Taoyuan in the summer of 1968, which had much better performance than that of the older model U-2C. Pilots start to use the full pressure suits. The new transistorized Elaine recorder System 21 and the later System 17B could collect enemy communications and the signals 10 times more than the old system. Another Elaine system with the code name Long Shaft could intercept microwave government communications more than 400 miles inside the enemy territory when flying above 70,000 feet. With long-range oblique reconnaissance camera the U-2 could still take the pictures of active days on the ground up to 60 miles inland. 
even fly 20 miles away from the coast. The MiG-21 often came up to intercept and attack with their heat-seeking missiles. An infrared warning sensor on U2R, System 20, could detect heat source of incoming enemy fighter or L2L missiles in a 45-degree downward tail cone within 20 miles range. This sensor alerts Janison to avoid a collision with the zoning up MiG-21 on April 29, 1971. The Chai Kongs did sneak red flag missile battalions to the island 40 miles away from the coast to ambush you two twice without success. When President Nixon visited Beijing in February 1972, he promised Premier Zhou Enlai to remove U.S. military forces from Taiwan. The coastal mission was then stopped in May 1974. The Black Cat Squadron disbanded, ending the 15 years joint operation. Before talking about the contribution of this joint operation, let me show you the missions I had accomplished and the same pictures I took before I left squadron in January 1964. The red lines are country border lines. These black lines are the tracks of 10 missions I had completed, which covered most populated areas in mainland China, some parts of Korea, and the northern Indochina. This is an aerial photo of Peking, which I brought back from the mission on August 11, 1962. It was taken at 14 miles up from the sea level. All the films taken by U2 over China is now stored in National Archive at College Park, Maryland. We are allowed to copy the natives with a camera. Then I scan its positive into the computer to make this slide. This process has certainly downgraded its resolution. However, we still can see clearly Ring Road around the city where the old city wall used to be, the forbidden city where the emperors used to live, Zhongnanhai, where the top Air Trump Communist Party reside, the famous Tiananmen Square where the massacre was taking place in the Temple of Heaven. This is the picture of the nuclear processing plant in Lanzhou, in the northwest interior of China, which was taken on June 3, 1963. Besides, I would like to share with you a funny episode during my five years flying U2. Some of you may have heard I had a night training mission from Laughlin Air Force Base to Utah and back on August 3, 1959, which ended up with a forced landing near Cortez, Colorado. The next day, U.S. Air Force sent a C-124 to Cortez to ship back the damaged U-2. Major Dick Waters came by the transport and brought me the civilian cruises. We went to downtown to have lunch. After we ordered food, several gentlemen came to our table as they already knew the accident from the local paper. They joined us to talk about how fortunate I was to make a forced landing on a small airport in the Rocky Mountain area in a dark night. How the manager of the airport was astonished to see a strange man wearing strange suit and a helmet. 
walking into the control room in the middle of the night and speaking with strange accent. He had never heard any aircraft named U-2 nor seen any precious suit. One of the gentlemen on the table said to me, When you stepped into the control room last night, you should have said to the manager, Take me to your leader, like an alien from the outer space. During these 15 years, ROC pilots flew 102 missions penetrating the bamboo curtain, including flights over North Korea and the northern Indochina. Surfaced air missiles shot down five U-2s over mainland China. Three pilots were killed and the two were taken prisoner. Comparing to the American U-2s, penetrated Soviet airspace 24 times with only one aircraft lost and no pilot killed. The operation of the Black Cats were much more audacious. In the early stage of operation, the safety record of U-2 was the worst of all military aircraft. During the years 1956 to 1958, out of 50 aircraft produced, 17 were destroyed in accidents, 11 pilots were killed. By the same token, Seven other Chinese pilots lost their lives in routine training flights and the coastal missions. From this chart, we can see among the 21 Chinese pilots qualified before 1968, 10 were killed, 2 were captured the casualty rate was very high. What had this joint operation accomplished? The U-2 program provided sufficient intelligence to the Republic of China in Taiwan to refine her strategy of recovering the lost mainland. The best time to invade mainland was 1963 while PRC had not restored the economy after the Great Famine of 1961 and the Sino-Russia split in 1960. The capability to produce a nuclear weapon was yet to be seen. However, military activity against PRC required the consensus of the United States. Under the U.S. ROC Mutual Defense Treaty signed in December 1954. Probably because the lesson learned from the Bay of Pigs invasion, the United States did not support military activities against the mainland or even the proposed airdrop of small scale special forces to establish anti communist bases inside the mainland. Finally, President Jiang Gesek sent his son Jiang Jingguo to Washington DC to solicit concurrence. He met with President Kennedy in the White House on September 11, 1963, but no agreement was reached. From that time on, the possibility of recovering the mainland was continuous wearing thin. The U-2 only provide early warning to ROC about any intention of the Chaikans to invade Taiwan or the offshore islands. For the United States, Detachment H provided the precise locations of the strategic targets in the Far East area for her global defense and monitored the nuclear weapon development in the PRC. The intelligence collected was obviously essential 
to the safety of the U.S. armed forces fighting in Vietnam and stationed in South Korea. Detachment H also provides real tests of the newly developed airborne electronic warfare equipment, including the radar warning receiver, the radar jammer, the infrared detector, and the various wideband signal recorder in hostile territory. On the other hand, the People's Republic of China might have been another beneficiary of this reconnaissance operation. After the bamboo curtain erected, it was impossible to collect intelligence in the PRC through traditional espionage methods. Without the U-2 electronic intelligence, Dr. Henry Kissinger could not have known before his second trip to Beijing in October 1971 that Marshal Limpia had died after the failure of an attempted coup. Limpia was the designated heir of Chairman Mao and was the most prominent figure against established relations with the United States. Without U2's intelligence, President Nixon might not have been able to implement his strategy of rapprochement toward the PRC. Subsequently, President Nixon visited Beijing before extending them U.S. recognitions, which brought PRC out from isolation. The pilots of the Black Cat Squadron did not expect to contribute towards easing the tension of the Cold War in realizing the depths of conflict between two most influential countries of the Communist bloc. They endured long, hot hours, squeezed into a small cockpit, facing the danger of enemy missiles and their own aircraft malfunctioning deep inside the enemy territory. They were just patriotically executing the missions for the Republic of China. Nevertheless, they had performed the most courageous operation in the U-2 history.